This episode was brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For M-Lock grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Two, one big door, two packs, break on one, over. 
Welcome to Pick 1, a mental exercise brought to you by Nine Hole Reviews. In each Pick 1 episode, we deliberately ask you to choose between two options with opposing weapon systems and give you a scenario to mentally put yourself into. We publish this scenario and options on all of our social media pages about a week before our live discussion segment for members and audience to comment and most importantly, to vote on the poll. During our live Pick 1 segment, we will discuss the scenario in our four-part live discussion. Part 1. A review of the scenario and options. Part 2. We discuss our choices and why. Part 3. We discuss comments that stood out to us. And finally, Part 4. We open the forum to any viewer that's present to join us in the live chat. Now to start this week's Pick 1 exercise, this is a recap from our previously published scenario brief. Nineteen eighty two Falkland Islands, aka the Islas Malvinas. It's been a month since the Argentinians have occupied the islands, and while the Royal Navy dominates the seas, the recent sinking of the HMS Coventry to the Argentinian Air Force has no doubt emphasized the need to deny enemy air assets. You are the ranking NCO to a small British SAS reconnaissance team of five troopers, and you have a new mission. Naval intelligence has identified a small airfield on the northern island with about a dozen aircrafts, of which six FMA IA-58 Pucaras aircrafts, the close air support aircrafts, another four Turbo Mentor Lights attack aircrafts are posing a threat to the Royal Marines on their march to the capital, Port Stanley. Now your team will insert via kayaks under the cover of darkness onto the beachhead about six miles away on the north-northwest of the objective to establish an observation post, an OP, for 48 hours. You will be located within one kilometer of the objective. Now you will have limited radio contact with a main assault element. However, your team shall confirm that all 10 main aircrafts are grounded prior to the attack. You estimate a company plus of Argentinian soldiers that are also in the vicinity providing security to the airfield amongst Argentinian Air Force maintenance and aviation personnel. Once confirmed that all 10 targets are on ground, the main element of 40 SAS troopers will be then inserted by helicopter from the aircraft carrier HMS Hermes. Your team will link up with the main element, provide overwatch and security for the sabotage element to destroy the objective that's grounded, and exfiltrate by helicopter or by kayak if the landing zone or LZ is compromised or overrun. Now, if your OP is compromised or discovered before the main assault, you will have to exfiltrate by foot to the shoreline to call in a hasty helicopter extraction. But there have been extremely heavy headwinds and it's already caused multiple helicopter crashes. On top of that, the Argentinians could also potentially respond with the aircraft on the airstrip that your mission is trying to destroy. Now, local weather is high winds, high precipitation, and the island is relatively flat with a very gradual terrain change. Now, furthermore, Royal Marines on the march to Port Stanley will unlikely be able to respond immediately uh, in time due to the isolated island and also the distance required to march, much less the water. If your position is compromised, it would be best to dig in and defend against Argentinian ground forces. Гораздо двух крайних периодов страны 
Здесь металл погадки, рут слева, есть загорание двух крайних светодиодов. Центр не горят, метра погадка. Welcome, welcome to the discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is episode four of Pick One, where we delve into the airfield sabotage role of the SAS. And uh, accompanied me, uh, first of all, Josh could not make it to this uh, session, but I've asked my friend Marty, who is a historian, and in fact, a bit of a celebrity, because Marty has also hosted shows on Discovery Channel, History Channel, and Science Channel, and very fancy cable TV network, things like that. <laughs> and on top of that, of the three of us, Marty has actually been to the Falklands. In fact, he was leading tours to see some of these places at the Falkland Islands. So um, I'd like to welcome Marty to the show. And I would also like to welcome my friend Mike from Bloke on the Range. Hi. Mike is a British small arms expert. Um, he is a content creator whom we've worked with for a while at this point. I think Mike uh, was our very first Patreon supporter. So <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate that very, very much as well, Mike. Pleasure. So I deserve it. As we jump into this scenario, um, I want to first of all highlight that this is a this is based on a real mission. This was a very very real event, and these were very real threats to the British forces that were um, that were running missions on the Falkland Islands. Um, and as we delve into any of these uh, mission sets. I'd like to start every single mission set by looking at the Met TC. Uh, Met TC was is an acronym that we used in the U.S. Army to evaluate um, not just the mission set, but also the environment on uh, planning a mission itself. So uh, Met TC stands for uh, Mission Enemy. Terrain, time considerations, troop considerations, and civilian considerations. So to start this off, let's look at the mission first and foremost. We're looking at a classic SAS airfield sabotage mission, which this really harkens back to the old school World War II SAS type of missions where they would be riding around in those Pink Panther Jeeps in the uh, desert, <laughs> destroying airfields with machine guns and grenades and explosives. So that seems to be the mission set of the greater mission. But as far as us on the um, six-man recon element, our mission is to be the eyes and the ears of the actual sabotage element as they come in. So while the greater mission is to support, the higher level mission is to support a, an airfield sabotage mission, to deny enemy air assets. Our mission is a recon uh, mission, a long range reconnaissance mission per se. So let's see, Met TC, uh, okay, E, enemy forces. Uh, Marty, I asked Marty to really look into the enemy forces on this. And um, one of the reasons why the 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 guest list this time consists of me, Marty, and Mike. Just uh, Josh not being able to make it, regardless, is in fact that all three of us have experience and actually own all of the major firearms used during the Falkland Islands campaign. Uh, Mike and I, we both have SLRs. Marty, I believe you used to have an SLR. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, we all have, uh, Mike, do you have a metric foul? At least you have experience with a metric fouls. Um, I've shot a Belgian one and a, an Austrian one a couple of times. Okay. Um, we all have the early M16s. Uh, Marty has an actual full auto M16. Mine is a hodgepodge uh, kit build from uh, a surplus part. And Mike's is also a pinned full auto M16. 
We also, all three of us, have Sterling submachine guns, which Marty has the coolest automatic <laughs> one. Mike has the semi-coolest, which is the open bolt uh, pinned in the semi position. And I have the school nerd version of the uh, Sterling SMG, which is the semi-auto closed bolt version. I'm kind of jealous of that, though. <laughs> Me too. I'd like to have one, actually. Yeah, I think we've I got need, to get into one. that as a different topic <laughs> down the road. <laughs> but because of that, um, I wanted to draw, I wanted to outline that because as we get into the friendly forces and enemy uh, analyses, that's going to be important because we're not we're not drawing this from a textbook knowledge. All three of us have had ample experience on most of the main infantry weapons used during the Falklands campaigns. So um, enemy forces. Let me load some photos that Marty had sent me earlier. What are we looking at as far as the uh, enemy forces, Marty? Well, the big famous part of the Argentine deployment of the Falklands it was the way that they made use of reserve forces. And it used to be that the old way of looking at the war was to understand what Argentina did and that they sent these brutalized conscripts over because there was still mandatory service within the Republic of Argentina at the time. That's only part of the story, though, because a significant amount of, of what uh, participates in Operation Rosario, which is the invasion on April 2nd. And then a lot of what is still present on the island are standing Argentine army units. So that you have like the um, uh, the seventh mechanized infantry regiment, for example, will fight on Wireless Ridge. The fifth mechanized infantry battalion will fight on Mount Longdon. Uh, you have units like that, that are regular army units and they're real tough characters. Um, but they stand in strong contrast to these reserve conscripts that I think are probably a, a, probably a much better known part of the Falklands War. I remember when the war was playing out when I was a kid and I was watching it unfold every night on the news, there was a lot of talk about the conscripts and how I was kind of fed this line about it being an entirely conscript army. And that wasn't an entirely accurate portrait of, of what the Argentines put in the islands because they they did put conscripts there but they also had some extremely well equipped and well trained professional standing army soldiers in addition to some naval units that were particularly well armed and well trained so let's think let's let's look at the weapon set of what the argentinians were using um let's tell tell us tell me a little bit about the their main weapons and some secondary weapons that they were using Sure. For main weapons, the the big one, of course, is the Argentine version of the of the FAL, and famously, what they had there, they had it there functionally in four different categories, and that is the model fifty point zero zero, which were Belgian made guns that Argentina purchased um, under under contract. This was they did this uh, preliminary to licensed domestic production of the FAL at the. Um, uh, what is it? Fabricar Militar de Armas Portatiles, the military small arms factory in Rosario, upriver from Buenos Aires. And the FMAP guns came in the version that we would ultimately see as a commercial export to the United States. The ones on the screen right now, those are Belgian made 50.00 FALs. But then when they began domestic production, they made the uh, full stock version of the five. 50.00 with, with the heavier flash suppressor. They then made the famous 50.61 or para foul, as everybody likes to call it. They also then um, purchased some uh, the uh, Fusil Automatique Lourde, uh, the, uh, the phalo, as we like to say. And that paved the way then for domestic production of that. That would be the model 50.42. So. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Great shot of some of the 50.42s, the the phalos that are there. In fact, I end up calling them, it's kind of unfortunately named the FAP, F-A-P, the uh, Fusil Automatico Pesado, the heavy automatic rifle. Um, anyway, that represented the, the main inf standardized infantry weapon of Argentine forces, reserve and standing army forces. Secondary so to that, they're, they're also making use of the MAG-58 machine gun. I then there's also one. I don't see one in the photos. Yeah, maybe I don't have a good Mag 58 photo there for you, but they were using the Mag 58. There's a great example of a guy. Uh, here's here's a paratrooper right here. Yeah, 
you're seeing a bunch of the folding stock five zero point six ones right there. Uh, and yeah. strangely, I found some evidence of. Bart, them. Are you still with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh -oh. I can hear Marty. Yeah, I thought I'm still good. I cannot hear you. Continue on. Okay. I found some evidence of them making use of Belgian made 50.61s because that's that's the type that they have on display in the museum on South Georgia. Have we lost Henry? I think we've lost Henry. <laughs> We're a ship with no okay. captain right now. Yeah. Uh, what do you keep talking yeah. about? <laughs> sure. Shall I continue then? <laughs> um, I was just saying that the the Mag fifty eight machine gun was was being used. Um, that that's all. Those that's your standard set right there. FALs and Mag fifty eights. Then you have this kind of interesting um, lineup of submachine guns, nine millimeter submachine guns being used. The Argentines had adopted a. a effectively a clone of the American M3 grease gun. It was called the PAM and both the PAM-1 and PAM-2 versions. And that was effectively just a copy of the American grease gun, only in nine millimeter. The only difference between PAM-1 and PAM-2 is there's an, an, ex, an external um, magazine well safety so that for your support hand, you can engage this, this magazine safety um, to reduce the likelihood of the firearm having a negligent discharge. They had Uzi submachine guns. In fact, the Butso Tactico units that are involved in the attack on, on Stanley itself on April 2nd, some of them are carrying the Uzi submachine gun, um, particularly with the Woodstock. They're making also use of the Sterling in the L34A1 version, the suppressed Sterling. You see- um, the photo earlier. That's yeah. One of the, the famous surrender photos was- uh, Right, yeah. Right, yeah, right there at Government House in Stanley, where you see um, that the one Argentine commando with his suppressed L-34A1 leading some of the members of, um, of, of Landing Party 8901 out at the time of their surrender. They also had a couple of domestically produced submachine gun versions, most notably the Halcon submachine gun. That was a company that was located in Argentina that made 9mm submachine guns. That's in addition to some oddities that come up with um, Argentine naval forces. The Argentine Navy had BM-59E select fire rifles in the Falklands. We know that they were there. They show up in some photographs. What we can't prove is the Argentine Navy's use of the, the FN-49 rifle. We know that the Argentine Navy had FN-49s. We just don't know if they made it to the Malvinas during the 74 days of the occupation. Uh, we do know that the BM, we do know that the BM 59 E's were there, although in very small numbers. And it's likely that those firearms didn't get anywhere out of Stanley because you had naval shore parties that carried that as their standard weapon. And that's where all the photos of the BM 59 E's come from. They're in the vicinity immediately of the city of Stanley. In terms of the forces up in the hills though, uh, you had some conscripts up there with their with their um, Belgian-made FALs. Then you had like 7th Mechanized Infantry Regiment, 5th Mechanized Infantry Battalion, and they're fighting with domestically produced FALs along with their MAG-58 machine guns. And so, were, the, were, there not, know, were there not also some, um, I seem to recall reading somewhere about um, some Browning 1919 A4 machine guns being used as well? This is true. I shouldn't leave that out because I've got some great photos of those. The, they called it, it was designated ALAM-3, um, and all it was was effectively an Argentine 1919A4. You've, you're familiar with it. You've seen it. Chambered in 7.65. So there was some, some of those there. 7.65? Yeah, chambered for the 7.65 cartridge, interestingly. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Wouldn't that be a nice little package? Yeah, chambered yeah. for the 7.65 cartridge, interestingly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And Henry's back. Oh. And he's gone again. <laughs> and he's back. Hi. There we go. Henry, well, welcome that. to the show. Nice of you to join us. Thanks. No, the uh, connection the connection in the study just uh, died for some reason. So I've gone out here right next to the router. So we, we shouldn't have any more uh, issues with the uh, connection. 
Sorry, I, I was listening to what you were saying. So you were describing a lot of the weapon systems on the enemy side yeah, right. and the characteristics of the enemy. So the next thing, um, if you didn't have any much more to add, would be the troop considerations. So for us, obviously, we are the we are in, going in as the um, uh, the SAS as five plus one SAS troopers. You are a um, uh, a ranking NCO under the SAS. So you are presumably better trained, better equipped, and, and uh, you have a little bit more resources on your dispose. Uh, but your numbers are still not that great. You're talking about six versus a company plus size. That's 20 times, 25 times the amount of, so one, one of yours equals 25 of theirs. Uh, those are not. Uh, I mean, U.S. Army dictates three to one on the uh, on the fight, so that's, that's a, little, a little bit far away from the uh, the ratio that we've got right here. Um, furthermore, uh, Mike, I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to add to the um, uh, our troops. Well, I think that just it's much simpler than the Argentine situation, so we can run it down pretty quickly and without actually touching them because that would be breaking the uh, <laughs> YouTube rules. Mm -hmm. um, the standard. Uh, infantry rifle of the British forces at the time was the L1A1 SLR, mixture of plastic stocks and wooden stocks. At the time, it was kind of in the in the transition there. Um, Rifles-wise, there was also um, amongst the Marines in particular small numbers of early M16s, Colt 60Xs, particularly 604s. Sexy slab side pre forward assist ones, very very small issue. Um, the special types, as we'll get into this later, had a far greater proportion of them. Uh, machine guns wise, there were two. So the uh, British version of the Mag fifty eight, so the L seven A one general purpose machine gun GPMG, belt fed. Um, there were also L four light machine guns, which are seven point six two NATO conversions of Brens particularly of Bren Mark uh, 3s mostly, I believe, uh, which is the lightweight one. And um, the Royal Marines in particular carried a lot of them. And I believe that the Royal Marines section was running typically one GPMG, one LMG, which is quite a chunky amount of firepower. Because you've got to understand that the, the British line infantry uh, is still running a variation on the Second World War gun group, rifle group set up. Um, now, oh yeah, there's a there's there's various pictures, and uh, Henry's put in a mixture of um, SLRs. Oh, that one, go back one, go back one. He's got an LMG mag. The guy in the middle has a thirty round LMG mag on that because it's Ali. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk not... about we'll talk about Ali the Ali ness yeah. of these items um, later. This was North Ireland, I think. Submachine guns wise, um, there's one. There's the Sterling SMG. I've got mine there. Uh, that was for people embuggered with other things like radios, um, anti-tank weapons, uh, officers, although I believe a lot of platoon level officers, so lieutenants, that sort of thing, would uh, carry a rifle to be less conspicuous and because they can actually do rather more with it. Uh, Colonel H's famous run that got him uh, got him decorated and killed uh, was with a with a Sterling. Yeah. But they were, they, they were not used in the same way that that the Sten was in World War Two. They were basically PDWs by that point. They weren't sort of. They weren't really considered offensive weapons by that point, really. Um, and that, and that's basically it. It's a much more simple, much more unitary setup. Um, and the vast majority of non-special forces carried SLRs. End of story. Of infantry, not non-remfs. Right. So now, time. Major so we're inserting by night, and basically you're spending 48 to 72 hours on on ground at the objective with uh, little to no real support because of the uh, radio distance. Um, and you couldn't get troops onto the mainland without crossing waters, and you don't have air superiority at this point. So... Many things pointed at it. Your time consideration, you're looking at a lot of nighttime operations, uh, nighttime insertions. Um, but I think we'll talk about a little bit more of that in a little later base, uh, a little later uh, date. Let's see. 
Terrain, Marty, I wanted to talk to you about the terrain. And, and Marty specifically has been to the uh, location. So um, tell me about it. The Falklands are, are an interesting place in terms of terrain because you've got wide ranging terrain. First of all, you've got a lot of these, almost these open moors. You don't have trees there. The temperature and the wind is such that you really just don't have, you don't have stands of trees. And so what you have is a lot of exposed open ground that's uh, that's populated by tussock grass. It's very thick grass that's also quite tall. And then when you get in close to Stanley, even much of the much of the shoreline around the island group, around the archipelago, is rocky. Um, just to the immediate west of the city of Stanley, you've got um, some rather significant hill masses that are primarily rocky. But Pebble Island itself is um, it's an island that in the center part where the settlement is, it's, it's a low slung area. Uh, it's, it's at the narrowest part of the island, which is where the airfield existed because it was low slung and it was flat, flat as a pancake, perfect place for an airfield. But you also have some terrain elsewhere. You have rocky coastline for the most part with just a few narrow coves with sandy beaches. Uh, you know, the archipelago consists of over 770 islands. Uh, the big ones are, of course, East Falkland, West Falkland, and then Lafonia. Those are the major ones. Then you have over 700 smaller islands. Pebble, Pebble Island is, I think, either the fourth or the fifth largest island in the entire archipelago. And so what you end up having there is an, an island that doesn't present you with many opportunities for cover and concealment. And the area around the airfield is effectively just wide open. There's really no terrain that can conceal an approach. Uh, there's uh, there's very little terrain that you could use uh, to protect a force, which is why I believe that the raid it was selected that the raid would go in by cover of darkness, because otherwise it would be far too easy to observe them in an approach. Okay, I think Henry has. Uh, Have we lost him again? again? <laughs> I think we've lost him again. Um, well, I mean, well, Mike, let's just me and you have a great chat about the Pebble Okay, <laughs> well, basically, I've been to the Hebrides. Hey, he's back. Um, I've been to the Hebrides, which is the Western Isles of Scotland, and that's often described as being fairly similar sort of terrain. Um, it's not particularly high. It's boggy. It's wet. It's, it's blowy. It's kind of nasty. Um, and, yeah, complete lack of trees. Right. Well, it sounds like the Hebrides are just like the Falklands because in my time there, and, and I like to point out that the only times that I went there was in the high summer when it was presenting the fairest conditions and it was still completely miserable to the point of we, I think the warmest that it ever I ever experienced in the Falklands was in the mid 50s Fahrenheit. So it just, it just wasn't warm. The wind never stops. I, I shouldn't say that. The wind r rarely stops. It's this unrelenting wind. I was experiencing winds there. They were really interfering with what we were doing because when I was there, I was working on a cruise ship and my cruise ship would, would pull into port and it really interfered with our, um, our, our ground excursions. Um, the ship that I worked on when, when I was down there uh, was an expedition capable ship. So it was a smaller ship that had Zodiacs aboard. And the big selling point of what we offered in terms of cruise packages was that we could go ashore anywhere. And we often found in the Falklands that uh, we weren't able to deliver on that just because the weather howled in so much. It, I mean, Stanley itself is 51 degrees south. So you're really, you're really getting, you're really getting close to the pole. Uh, when when you're there, which is why those conditions are like they are, which is why you just don't see. Yeah, there's a great shot of me on Wireless Ridge right there um, during one of the tours. Yeah, that little GPMG. Well, that's I'm sorry, it's an Argentine Mag 58 tripod that's on Wireless Ridge, looking north toward Teal Inlet, sort of. Uh, at any rate, what you what you see there is that's a great perspective of showing you how there's all this low windswept growth. And there's just not much there that can protect you from the elements. Uh, and I believe that that's why the population of the islands has never really expanded into anything beyond about 
gosh, it feels like when I was there, it was 1,800 people. And I feel like that's brought the population of the islands was about 100 years ago. It, the islands just don't um, present a really favorable place for human life to flourish. That's why you get so much hurting that goes on in the Falklands, uh, because there's not much else you can do. You do have plenty of tussock grass so that if you're herding sheep, they have plenty to eat. They're a largely weatherproof animal anyway. It's sort of the perfect conditions for that and not much else. Gents, I uh, apologize for the slight hiccup. I mean, I, I realize this is at the very opening of the, uh, of the show. My wife, and I, my wife has helped me set up temporarily <laughs> station at the uh, breakfast table. So I do have a separate screen to show everybody the uh, items that we needed to show them as well. Um, that's why the uh, split screen came back. So, all right. So where were we? We've done the terrain. Terrain. Civilian consideration. What are we looking at on the civilian consideration site, Marty? Let me pull up the map so you so so I could really zoom in and out of um, the any type of civilian settlements that are there. There aren't many, and that's just it. The island group at the time of the war in 1982, less than 2,000 people. Most of uh, most of them living within the city of Stanley on East Falkland. Then you ended up with what they call camp settlements down there. That is, you have a number of dispersed settlements at places like North Arm, Goose Green, Fitzroy. You, um, you have these smaller settlements in addition to um, settlements that were basically maybe a house or two for one family. And so you have Stanley with a population of about a thousand people and then a handful of other, if you can call them towns, very small settlements, settlements for more than one family. That's how I would put it. And then all of these smaller settlements that are effectively just settlements for single families, which is basically what Pebble Island was at the time. So, so Pebble Island we're talking about is all the way up here on uh, Falkland, on the Falklands. Right, correct. So, well, it's the northern part of West Falkland. Okay, I was uh, I was gone for this. Were you able to talk about the uh, the terrain changes between Pebble Island and the rest of Falkland? I did comment a little bit about that, and that with but Pebble Island kind of presents it gives you an image of um, almost all that the island group has to offer because. The area where the settlement is and therefore where the airfield is, is a low slung flat area that was ideal for an airfield. But then you also have some height to the north of the settlement in the airfield. So there's some terrain to the north. Then you have the low slung flat part and there was a small sandy beach quite close to the settlement itself. So in, in a way, Pebble Island kind of functions as a better, uh, as an excellent metaphor for the rest of the island group, it, it kind of offers you basically everything else you would encounter there. Aside from, of course, the the major topographical features that you would experience on East Falkland, and those are features like Mount Kent, uh, Mount Challenger, Mount Harriet, the Twin Sisters, Mount Longden, and Wireless Ridge. Okay. All right. So with all that laid out, did you either one of you gents have anything to add to the uh, the baseline scenario itself. I think the only thing I'd say that the baseline scenario, the one thing that's not realistic is if you compromise the idea of digging in and holding your ground. And we discussed this in preparation beforehand that the only realistic solution if you're compromised is to peg it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Basically. And we'll get into this. We'll get into this in, in the discussion later. But that's the one. That's the one thing I would question in the uh, in the underlying scenario. Right. right. So are yeah. we are we ready to go into our picks as the hosts? Let's dive in. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to uh, part two. This is our pick. Right, so uh, for this portion, typically I started off um, and then I let, uh, and then Josh chimes in on his thoughts and then we let our guest 
uh, as the final pick. However, since I am the sole host for this one, I'll start it off. I'll let Marty talk about it, who is above me, and then we'll pop down to Mike afterwards. So for me, as you look at the scenario and as you look at the terrain, and if you look at the battlefield itself, to me, the 4X scope does not uh, necessarily tell me that I, I doesn't scream at me that I have to have it. It is nice to have because especially with the uh, suit scope, and I know Mike has his thoughts about this. Um, the suit scope is, is not the best scope to have. However, I do, I do want to consider the fact that the Falklands are an extremely windy and out and, and, the northern, the northwestern side of the Falklands, Pebble Islands, very windy and very flat and open terrain. Um, despite the L1A1 being extremely long, um, I don't think it would hinder me as much to maneuver with it. Despite the suit site having its obvious drawbacks, um, being an early prismatic infantry optic, I still feel like the L1A1 with the 7.6251 caliber um, can reach longer distances. And in windy conditions, which is almost a permanent in the Falklands, um, will end up serving me a little better. So for those reasons, let me put the, let me put the banner up. I am going to pick the suit. Henry, could you get rid of that pop-up? Uh, yes, people have been mentioning right. it in the. Uh, that I must have accidentally clicked the comments. That there. It's hiding half of my ugly mug, which is unfortunately <laughs> making it look even more bold. <laughs> Maybe I need to put the helmet back on. There we go. <laughs> is it still up there? No, no it's, it's gone. Not. Okay, good. Right. So, um, with that, with that said, my pick is going to be the L1A1, the SLR. Um, optional whether I want the Trilux or not, it's not a must for me. So anyways, Marty. M16, final answer. The reason I think that is the, the mission itself. This mission is effectively just a reconnaissance overwatch mission. And this is the type of mission where if you fire a shot, the mission has been compromised and the mission's failed and you're gonna have to scrub anyway. And the result of that then is your your weapon is there just to to affect a break con break in contact with the enemy, to provide you the capability of disengaging, fighting your way out of the scenario, and beginning your exfiltration on the grounds that the mission would have to be scrubbed. And when you consider those circumstances, the circumstances that are really the essence of this mission, I feel like the M16 is the better weapon, and that's because first of all, it's lighter. It's the L1A1, although it's a fine firearm, it's, it's a bit heavy and a bit unwieldy. The M16 gives you a lighter weight and a more compact package, and you're capable of carrying more ammunition. And then further to that point, my expectation is that if you were compromised in an overwatch position and you had to break contact with the enemy, the idea would be to lay down as much of a volume of fire as possible to cover your withdrawal, and it feels like the M16 would do that a little bit better. Okay. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. Now, so Mike, un unless Marty, unless you have any other uh, items to talk about. No, no. I want to hear from Mike now. Um, no, it's, it's, it's not a hard choice at all. Um, and, and I entirely share Marty's view and the view of the guys that actually did it for real, which is that the, there's no, there's no question that the, M16 is by far the better choice uh, in general, not only given the mission parameters, but it really very much is the better choice of rifle. And that's what they took. And if you've got a small uh, uh, OP team like this, everyone having an M16 is the way forward. Um, should this be the good point to have the analogy we talked about? 
from, um, from Gulf War One, or should we do that it. later? Send it, Mike. Okay, because we have a we have a similar example that's much better known from Gulf War One, which was the Bravo Two Zero debacle, where they were to set up an OP, they got compromised by uh, a goat herding tween, um, <laughs> and they had to do a fighting withdrawal, and they were armed with M16s and Minimis. Um, basically, that's worse terrain in certain respects um, compared to the Falklands scenario, simply because the, you can drive vehicles on it. At least in the, in the Falklands, it is, uh, you're not going to be driving vehicles very fast over open terrain because it's boggy, so they're going to be limited to sort of walking pace anyway. Basically, if, if you don't get compromised, if the mission is a complete success, you don't fire a shot. If it does get compromised, what you're going to do is break contact, get towards your exfiltration point with the minimum kit. So you probably want to just dump everything other than the belt kit and the radios for comms and peg it. And you've got to outpace um, what's probably conscript troops. Uh, if they get close enough to, to bring effective fire on you, you want to suppress them so that you can break contact again. And in principle, you're going to be fitter and more determined and a much harder bastard than any of them. Um, and literally the point of your rifle is just to give them the big F off enough to break contact again and then just keep ahead of them until you get to your exfiltration point. Um, and the M16 and the larger quantity of ammunition and the lighter weight and the lighter weight of the overall loadout is going to do that. Um, the Overwatch thing, as someone put it in the um, in the live comments, that uh, uh, if the mission's a success and going through Overwatch, you're not participating in the firefight. I mean, you're within one kilometer of the of the objective. That's a lot. That's that's a long that's a long way. You're, you, I mean, you're probably out of rifle shot. If, you're, if your brief is to get within one kilometer, you're not going to be getting it to 200 meters or something. You're, you're going to be a bit more distance. Distance is safety. Um, you're going to be radio, radioing through what's going on. I mean, just to reiterate, your, your role is as, a, as an observation post. Um, and the rifles are there literally just in case of compromise, in case you've got to get out. Um, SLR heavy, less ammunition. Um, doesn't make any sense and the the the, the four power scope it's not going to help with observation because you're within a kilometer anyway and you're probably on the longer end of that you're going to have binoculars anyway which are going to be like eight times ten times or even more um in this scenario the slr has no redeeming features so um, sorry I'm, so I'm a real <laughs> fence sitter. Here. You, know, you know, most most people predicted that Mike was going to choose the SLR uh, based off of patriotism. I mean, people who watch the channel enough know I'm rather a fan of that one that I can't touch. <laughs> so <laughs> let let me so let me draw this uh, to a distinct conclusion, um, if I may, with a sentence. Both of you choose the M16 to preserve the nimbleness and the stealthness of you with a larger amount of firepower uh, to ward off the enemy in case of an engagement. Yes. Basically, if you're being chased and they get within close enough range to bring effective fire onto you, you can return effective fire. Okay. All right. Um, I know we're running a little short. I do want to get towards uh, reviewing some of the other comments. Uh, but before we get there, I know Mike distinctly had a lot of research and, and thoughts on the uh, Trilux as well. And you, you sort of mentioned a little bit of it, saying, saying that it's useless. Could you expand upon that uh, on the, the infantry sites? All right. Um they're not reliable sites. The tube itself is super robust. The mount is hot garbage. And it's a quick detach mount and it's hot garbage. And it's held in place with hook with like metal hooks and springs. And they don't return to zero very easily. In fact, they don't return to zero at all. Um, 
you're you're inserting by kayak so you're not going to have it on they're sensitive to knocks they're on Wrigleyton they're, they're just like it's a complete design by committee it's like we've got this pretty great tube for the era mid 70s how are we going to attach it to the rifle uh let's hook it onto some Wrigley tin they're cool. So let me ask you this: what, what was what was the design? What was the design parameter for it? Why why did the British military issue the Trilux in the first place? Um, as far as as I mean, a lot of people will be will be screaming designated marksman, but that's not a thing. Designated marksman is not a thing in the British doctrine until the L uh, L one twenty nine A one, the LMT AR ten derivative comes in, like decades later. Um, it's There'd always been a desire to have an optic for the for the infantry right back to the um, to the EM two project, um, and then they ins they introduced this in the mid seventies. And I mean, according to the manual, because we can we can take it from the horse's mouth here. Conveniently, uh, Mike Mike has the printout of a Trilux manual. <laughs> oh, this is the this is the um, rifle training manual. Okay, continue. <laughs> The optic sight is a detachable sight with a magnification of four and is supplied for use with the rifle in the infantry role. It is equipped with an il internally illuminated inverted aiming pointer. The sight is designed to improve night the night vision capability of the infantryman and enable him to engage targets at longer ranges than is possible with the naked eye. The amount of this improvement is dependent upon light falling on the target and the target slash background contrast. The range at which targets can be engaged effectively when using the sights at the lower sight level varies from two to three times that of the iron sights. By day, the optic sight assists in the acquisition and engagement of targets with low background contrast at the effective range of the rifle and is also a useful surveillance aid. The Trilux lamp used in the optic sight contains tritium gas from which no hazard can arise, blah, blah, blah. So there you go. That is it. It's literally optic goodera for which those I reasons. Must I must point, Marty. I, I don't. I don't think you know, you know this, but um, I, I have procured a Trilux for uh, Mike from the US of A. So I will have you. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. So Very we'll nice. both have Trilux or Trilux sights on our. Uh, yeah. Um, when I've got it over here, I will do lots of testing with it at three hundred meters. So great! Mike. Now, you, now you'll both have, as they were called, completely worthless sights. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've shot, I've, sh I've shot a bit with them, and when zeroed, they're okay. But if you knock them or take them off, which mm -hmm. in this scenario, if you're kayaking, if you've got the sight on, you're knocking it, so you've got to take it off and put it in the pouch, and then you've lost, you've lost, lost your zero. zero. Yeah. So let point? me ask you this: the 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 optic itself, um, or the iron sights per se. Was it designed with a flip down iron sight from the very beginning to accommodate um, an optic eventually to be added onto the rifles? Well, there was actually um, in the trials, there were optics similar to the um, EM2 optic. In fact, I think okay. it possibly even was the EM2 optic. Again, but again, mounted to Wrigley tin dust cover. Um, that's entirely possible. I've not actually found any documentation explaining why they went for flip up flip down hmm. um size perhaps that's something that we delve into as we uh, as we uh review our slrs and uh mm. suit sites when it, when yours goes gets to switzerland yes yes so um on that note gents we have both of your picks you two are choosing the american m16a1 and i am choosing the l1a1 with the optional Trilux, despite I don't really care if it's mounted or not. Is there anything else that we would like to add to this conversation at this point? The only thing uh, I would I would say is that my choice of the M16, uh, it is it is attached specifically to the mission itself. Um, when I, when I was leading tours down there, I spent a great deal of time in. The hills immediately around Stanley, specifically going up to Wireless Ridge and to Mount Longdon, uh, because they're close. That's where there was some really impressive act action, and and I would take people up to the Ian Mackay Victoria Cross site on on Longdon, and that area, the valley that's sort of north of Wireless and Longdon, 
I always just nicknamed it the Valley of 7.62 NATO because it was in so many ways like a rifleman's paradise in terms of how much range you could get. There was just no cover, uh, Mar Marty, wide open space. Are any of these in the photos that you sent me? Because I'd like to bring them yeah, up. Yeah, there should be a couple of photos. If you have photos of minefields, those are the, uh, the photos that I have of okay. the minefields, are the minefields yep. that the Argentines laid in that valley just to restrict movement. Because they understood that, they understood that their opposition was approaching them from the west. And so the Argentines established this U-shaped perimeter um, in the hills around Stanley. And of course, as we all know, they laid the area heavily with mines. And that had the effect of then uh, channelizing the approaching engaging force. It brought them under fire that the Argentines had already laid out. The Argentines weren't nearly as amateurish in laying out the defenses as I think sometimes people believe them to have been. They laid out a pretty effective defense. And what that had the effect of doing is that Everybody wanted to stay away from each other because, as Mike said earlier, uh, distance is safety. The farther you are away from the opposition, the safer you are. And they, the Argentines have the effect of, a, of creating circumstances by which, under daylight, it was very difficult for you to move into contact with, with the enemy, to move into contact with Argentine forces behind prepared defensive positions. Which is why then the, the final assault on Stanley, I mean, and I count that as beginning with the attack on Mount Longdon on June 12, 1982, stretching all the way to the final surrender at about nine o'clock at night on June 14th. That's why so much of the, uh, the critical aspects of that maneuver battle, they're unfolding, they're movements that are unfolding under the cover of darkness. Uh, because otherwise, you would never stand a chance of infiltrating into the Argentine positions. And it's because the Argentines had laid out the laid out their defenses in such a way that if the British attempted to approach under daylight, they could simply bring them under long range, accurate rifle and machine gun fire. And so the M16 suits the Pebble Island OP mission ideally. However, if you were fighting in daylight circumstances in those in the hills approaching Stanley, it feels to me like the SLR is the better rifle to choose. That is until the sun sets, at which point the engagement distances compress quite a bit. Because if you look at three paras assaults on Mount Longdon, all of that's at less than 100 meters. And that stands in strong contrast to, uh, you're probably familiar with the, the action that takes place at Goose Green on May 28th and 29th with two para, uh, where two para basically uh, conducts a direct frontal assault um, in daylight, and they lose people. They lose a lot of people. They lose, in fact, a, a commander. They lose Herbert Jones, the Victoria, the other Victoria Cross action, and he's brought down. Well, he's moving forward with his L2A3 Sterling, and he gets popped, uh, and, and that's by a position that he had already passed, and that's something that probably would not have happened if it was under cover of dark, but it was a daylight operation, and let's face it, those FALs, they're, they're going to give you, a, they're going to reward you with a more handsome dividend under daylight operations. Okay, so that actually ties back into our initial analysis on this. The fact that the time, uh, the time frame of our operation is majority at nighttime, um, um, movement is majority done at night, uh, you're attributing your choice to those decision factors as well. That's correct. Yeah. I've pulled up some of the images of the minefields yeah. that you were talking about. Right. So you can I, see yeah. rolling fields. And then, of course, if you know, if you know the area as mines, you are going to avoid the area as a soldier. Um, it's just a classic way of denying access to a location. And these were Argentinian mines, you said? Yes, sir. In fact, most of them, I mean, the Argentines laid them. The Argentines bought them from the Italians. They were these little SB-33 plastic mines, about 88 millimeter in diameter. And those little bastards are still out there. Oh, I believe there are over 100,000 of them still out there. There was an attempt in the immediate aftermath of the conflict to clear those, and 12 Royal Engineers got killed trying to pull mines up. And I, so thought they, they, I thought, I thought yeah. well, they finally demined the whole place, like, last year. I thought they finally managed it. Um, that may be the case. I don't. I'm not aware of it, but I can tell you that when I took that photo in 2009. Oh yeah, um, yeah, so I, yeah. They were still out there then. Yeah. There were just there were they everywhere. I mean, there were beach the the, the beaches right there, um, basically on the other side of the peninsula from Stanley, 
The Argentines mined those because those beaches would have been perfect for an amphibious landing. And the Arg Argentines, in anticipating that, mined those beaches. And we couldn't go anywhere near those beaches. And the south side of Mount Challenger and Mount Tumbledown, that was all this one big no-go zone. And you can see how well marked off those minefields are. The one that you're seeing right there is in that valley between Mount Longden, um, stretching north toward Teal Inlet, to kind of northwest toward Teal Inlet. Um, and those areas were, um, there was just, there was no considering possibilities of moving through that area, even on foot, because the mines are primarily plastic, so they haven't corroded in the, in the weather. The tussock grass has grown up so much that you'd never see one. You'd never stand a chance of avoiding one of those mines. And at least when I was down there, they were all still there. Let's see. So that's 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 actually that's super interesting. Um, I I think though still um, looking back at it, Marty's attributing most of the movement to nighttime over on Pebble Island, which my understanding was less of a fortification done to it, being an outlier island. Right. Yeah, Pebble uh, Island. They didn't they didn't have um, a terrain suitable for creating. The, the defensive positions that you would see on, on terrain features like Wireless Ridge and Mount Longdon, uh, where the Argentines actually realized some pretty nicely thrown together um, field expedient fortifications, and they made the best possible use of them. At Pebble Island, there really wasn't anything like that. You didn't have a rocky hill mass like you do on Wireless or Tumbledown. What you had is this the saddle basically between the high the two opposing high ends of the island. You had that flat area, and the result was that they had they had some fighting positions there, uh, but the positions were there was nothing no terrain that those positions could blend into, and no terrain that could also provide further protection to the positions. Interesting. So, I mean that that that's a very good analysis of that, but. Um, <laughs> That I, I would say secures the thought of you and Mike. Where is that? Is that is still not my choice? Um, uh, I think one thing that is compelling for me on the M16 is the ammunition capacity. Um, the fact that your ammunition is way less than half of the weight of a 76251 NATO, um, having more rounds during a, a um, during a break contact. Um, type of battle drill. I mean, that that's that's vital to breaking contact is having a massive amount of ammunition. So, um, should we just do? There's a lot of comments talking about wind. Yeah. Yeah. So and yes, um, and yes, fifty-five grain. Oh, sorry. Or is that? No, no. You, would you like to talk about it? Well, if you'd plan to talk about it in a in a bit, we can wait a bit. I think I have a comment on it. So. We can get to that in the next section. Yeah. We can um, get to that in the next section. Yeah. Great. Works for me. So um, that said, uh, would either one of you gents have anything else that you would like to add to your specific picks? That's a no. I, I should or, no. I should I should mention one thing, and is um, my backdrop here is misleading a little bit because I have a thirty round magazine in it. I have yet to find photographs of 30 round magazines in the 1982 South Atlantic conflict. Interesting. So, yeah. I have yet to see a single 30. Um, the, the, I, up on screen earlier, Henry put the, the famous Peter Holgate photograph. Peter Holgate was, um, was uh, a Royal Marine and a photographer in the Falklands. And there's that great photo of him where you can see his M16 quite nicely. He's got a 20 in there. Yeah. It should be. See if I could, uh, let me see if I could find that image. C continue, continue. I, I didn't yeah. even think about that. I, because I, I honestly, even in the the breakdown, I even said whether you choose the twenty round magazine or um, a thirty round magazine is entirely up to you. But I didn't know. I mean, Mike, are you familiar with the the, the uh, magazine selection of the SAS back then? No, I'm not. Sorry. Um, certainly later photos you're seeing 30s um, and they were certainly around uh, and in fact Marty, the, are you talk, uh, talking about this? 
Yeah, that's the, the Peter Holgate photo. You notice he's got his 20 round there. He's got an, an interestingly taped up 20 round magazine. Yeah. Int I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder why he, he has, I wonder if he's jungle, uh, jungle binding the two magazines. I wonder about that too, uh, because to me that, or maybe he was trying to cut down on reflectivity or maybe making it easier to grab it. I don't know. But or, maybe, see or, maybe the, or maybe the floor plate's falling off and it was the easiest way to fix it. Yeah, so this gentleman, this is obviously Paul Harrell holding an M16 with a Royal <laughs> Marine outfit. <laughs> it does look like Paul Harrell, doesn't it? It totally looks like him. Um, but I, I, I feel like that was a, a, a worthwhile point to mention just because we've been largely dwelling on the fact that the M16 provides you this greater amount of firepower. And, and although I do believe that, that it, that it does that at the same time, um, I have yet to find a magazine, I had yet to find a photograph of a 30 round magazine in the Falklands. So everyone out there, if you are able to find a photograph of British troops within M6 or 604, Colt 604, or, you know, at the M16A1 derivation, um, and you see a 30 round magazine, I'd be very interested in um, seeing seeing that. Yeah, the point saying. about yeah, the point about ammunition still stands though. The point that you just made, and that is that the obviously the rifleman equipped with the M16 is going to be able to carry a larger quantity of ammunition, which gives you the provides you a greater volume of fire, which I still think serves the mission better. The specific OP mission, it still serves it a little bit better. Um, but let's face it, if if we can't come up with a photograph depicting a 30 round M16 magazine in the Falklands, the SLR uh, has the option of using the L4 magazines, which were 30 round capacity, which That's you do true. see because it was right because it was alley it was badass it was a cool thing to do which mike i think you're going to talk about alley in the um next segment perhaps yeah let's talk we'll do that in the Great. next segment well let's uh let's switch to the comments because that is a very alley time. photo yeah <laughs> Let's see. Did we did we uh, switch over to part three yet? Uh, nope. Everything's running very slow on my end for some reason. I'm just going to manually switch over without the uh, fancy uh, cut screen. All right. So part three, as we uh, segment towards part three, we are going to talk about um, the comments that uh, all of you out there have made. So. Um, we've got together and looked through some of the comments, and really, there's so there has been so much dialogue between the three of us. But I've been deliberately asking Marty and Mike to hold back on some dialogue until we are able to talk about uh, these with the with a response to these comments. Now, one of them that that jumped out to me was that someone, uh, Chris Butler, here says that I swear the L1A1 has that Russian 1P29 scope on it. And then Jinji, the man, uh, <laughs> wrote back saying, isn't the 1P29 a direct copy, uh, co copy, C-O-P-P-Y, of the Trilux? It, it sure is. It Indeed, it is. And if you're wondering what the 1P29 is, we've actually shot this on our show. Um, uh, I think earlier last year, it was one of the coldest it was one of the coldest shots we did with the um, SLR 104, which is a direct copy of the AK-74. Uh, so you can see the similarities of it. Interesting to me, though, if you really look at this, look at the cam bridge right here is specifically what I'm looking at. So you have a pivot point in the front, just like the Trilux. You have the, the distance selector in the back, although the distance, uh, the elevation selection for the 1P29 is 400 camming all the way up to, I believe, 800, 900 meters. So it actually has more adjustments than the uh, uh, the suit. The, yeah, the, suit the, for, the sighting. It's, 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 um, it's 300 and 600 meters. And part of the reason why the pointer right. comes down from the top is to make it easier to hold over to get intermediate ranges. So, but it's a, it's a two, it's a two so range the, sight. The interesting. Right. So, so the interesting thing is I, I personally, I, I was surprised when I first uh, got the 1P29 
twenty nine or one P twenty nine to to shoot with for uh, um, our practical accuracy ses practical accuracy session. It was actually harder, like the Trilux suit. It's actually harder to shoot at close range targets because your reticle at close range is then obscuring your target. So um, the let's see. So when we're when we're looking looking at this, the interesting thing is the Soviets deleted the QD arm for the Trilux optic. If you look at the Trilux optic, there's a QD arm right here, and that's, that's a latch point. You can see it in my brief video. That's a latch point which you flip up, and you could detach it. The Israelis, actually, if you look at the Israeli copy, they put a screw in there to disable that latch point, so it would permanently latch onto a mount for the M16 or Galil, and a QD's down there on the base. So I don't have any permanent reference on this, but my thought process is that both the Israelis and the Russians looked at the suit design and realized that the tube is a very good design. It's a very rugged, it's very clear on the optics. The reticle is very uh, relatively usable. I mean, you, you can't mess it up because it's just a single post, but they recognize that the QD, this is my theory again, they recognize that the British QD function is suspect because I've shot three suit scopes at this point. And all three of them, when I detach it and reattach it, it loses zero. So massively so. I, wow. I don't I, I don't have a I don't have any documentation on why they designed the the mounting point to look like that. Um, but the bottom line is it, it seems like a very well designed scope with a very poor poorly designed uh, mounting location I suspect that it's typical let's see British typical. small arms establishment of the era they're not shooters they don't have first-hand experience on this it's a bit designed by a committee of people who are winging it it's real mm -hmm. men in sheds but who are not enthusiasts because the tube is sound the rifle is sound and everything between the two is just a disaster because <laughs> Because the mm. the top cover, I believe it's reinforced for the suit, but in any case, it just it's slides slightly in. reinforced. It's it slides into the rails, so right. There's always going to be a bit it, of tolerance and a bit of play in that anyway. It is a very and tight then fit, but even so, it's still a friction fit. Yeah, in the in the receiver, and you're just relying on recoil. Um, bumping it up to the front every time there's no it's not positively indexed there's nothing driving it up against the stop at the uh, uh the front of the receiver it's literally just after after a couple of shots of recoil it'll be there and it'll stay there so i think the, the interesting terrible thing idea. the interesting thing that that you made earlier was the kayak insertion brings a an extra level of complex uh, complication to running a Trilux on an L1A1 because you want the lightest possible configuration on your rifle as you insert if you're pulling security approaching your target. Um, and the lightest option for the SLR is without the suit sco scope. If you remove the suit scope and reattach it, it's effectively useless. Yeah. So, so, the, so I think that insertion technique is by using kayak is it draws a point of complication of using the SLR with the uh, with a suit as as you were talking about but that's just you know the reason that comment jumped out to me is because yes it absolutely was the 1P29 was a copy of it the israelis purchased the uh, suit scopes to put on their M16s um carbines carbines and um, uh, Galil's, uh, but they also screwed screwed down the QD flap so the soldiers would not, you know, play with it. Yeah. So and, anyway. and actually, this whole bad mount thing carries over to the Susa. I mean, the Susa mount is infinitely better than the suit mount, but it's still the massive weak point in the in the system because again, it's, it's I mean, it's tri it's it's Trilux again. Um, the the Susa tube is is fine for a fixed four power tube. It's just that mount and the springs and the opposed screw adjustments and the, the poorly designed rail. I mean, people like to criticize Picatinny mm -hmm. 
even though it's become the industry standard, but Picatinny's light years ahead of the standard, the original SA80 rail. Um, it's just, which is yeah. sort of a, it, it's sort of a pity. It's sort of a pity though, because again, the 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 tube is is a sound design. Which and then the mount. If you look at later designs like the, uh, right, like like I mean, you can have external uh, adjustments like the L cans that we still use on machine guns or. Uh, back when I was in the SF, really uh, special forces really liked to use the uh, Spectre DRs with the external elevation adjustment and external windage and ele and and, uh, and zeros. Um, so it can be done. It's just unfortunately the mounting solution is is less than ideal to the um, to the SLR, and nobody's going to improve upon it right now because it's 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 an antiquated piece of technology. Well, well, nowadays we got all the Anyways, civilian clamp on um, rigid clamp on mounts. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Which then gives you a uh, Picatinny top. Gives yeah, you it, it gives you a rigid Picatinny uh, top. And isn't it fascinating how in the last the forty years since the conflict, the the sighting systems have evolved to such an extent. Mm -hmm. um, and I make that observation because I also wanted to ask a question of the of the two of you, and that is, how weather resistant is the suit sight? Very. Yeah, the tubes. The tube is. You can't. You can't fault the tube on that. Yeah, it is ob obviously rain on the lens is going to be a big issue in the Falklands, mm -hmm. given that it's uh, it's rainy and uh, and in fact with a canoe insertion, getting salt water on the lens would just be disastrous when that dries. God, yeah, um, and then <laughs> sorry, hadn't, hadn't even thought about that actually. So yeah. yeah, another another demerit for the for the L1A1. Yeah, all right. I mean, yeah. So, so I'd like to I like to progress on. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time for sure. But, but given that Mr. Gangstar's comment uh, points to him being British, and well, my colonial boy English is just it simply would not cut it for this one. So, um, luckily, Marty, we have an Englishman in our presence. Do you, Thankfully, do you, do, you, do you do you need me to put on a specific? British accent, and if so, which one? <laughs> so that I whichever can one myself. you feel, whichever one you feel is appropriate. Can can you do like a posh BBC presenter? Channel Four type. Oh, we could do we could do a, a yes, a very good. Okay, and so I read it to uh, newsreel, Pathé News. <laughs> Gangstar, cool name, bro. <laughs> says, my best mate's dad led one of the patrols or attack parties that led the Pebble Island raid Major Thomas James Touche Turtle, British SAS. I take the M16 slash A1, same as the other SF leads that night. Almost all regular infantry carried the SLR unless they'd taken a full automatic foul of a dead RG. And then he gives some, he gives thanks. I'm not going to read all, all of that, um, but... Uh, Yes, there's a a very nice um, tribute. But, uh, oh, rest in peace out. for um, yeah. for rest in peace yeah, to the people being tri the, uh, tributed the good there. Who, who, who passed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. It was terrible. Uh, <laughs> I should have put a helmet on for it and everything. <laughs> well, we've still got more comments after this. So, oh, so this good. is this is interesting. This is interesting. An interesting point for us to talk about. Um, almost all regular infantry carried SLR unless they take in a full automatic foul off of the dead RG. Thoughts? Picks or it didn't happen. Yes. Well, there are picks, and but they all yes. seem to be posed. But that, but they seem to be posed in a captured position of people going grr and things like that. Pick, pick of someone using it unironically or it didn't happen. Yeah, I gotta admit that in my time speaking to veterans uh, from from the conflict, that uh, this comes up regularly. This idea of using captured Argentine weapons, and I think we all understand the the basic contours of the trope and the contours of the trope where they um, like to capture the Argentine guns because they were select fire. And I think Mike's right on target. Picks or it didn't happen. Well, so I for think. One thing Go ahead, oh, sorry, go on, Henry. Oh, no, no. Oh, I was, oh, I was going to say and that um, it was a point that Marty brought up uh, in preparation is that 
Um, using captured weapons, certainly in U.S. forces, is a big no-no. You brought that up as well, Henry. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that if you lose your personal weapon, other than when injured or something, you're probably on a charge. So if you were to abandon it willingly, so you've got your rifle that you know that you've cared for, that is zeroed to you, are you going to abandon it for a rifle that may have been cared for by a conscript who didn't really care, may have been in God knows what condition, doesn't use your magazine, so you've got to take, you've got captured magazines which are in what condition, the rifle's not zeroed to you, and all because it has a full auto capability that you A, don't need, and B, aren't trained on. So I think I think this is <clears throat> this comments one of those things that um, I don't want to be too hard on on people making these comments because it's always I understand they're not ill and it's not an ill. Oh intent. yeah, it's well it's well meant. They're always well. You meant. know, it, it's it's not it's not it's not to 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 say it's not to say to detract from someone's character um, on quoting these and who's to say a veteran wouldn't embellish some piece of. Uh, uh, some piece of history to make it more interesting because the majority I of believe war is, we've done a video awesome. on this Henry <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll reference that in, in a later in a later <laughs> point but um, my my thing is a lot of these were not first-hand accounts that you hear it from and it's not that yeah. it has to be a first-hand account that we hear it from it has to be a first-hand documented account that I would find it to be uh, credible uh, so a lot of these comments, we hear it a lot, but we don't see a lot of evidence, actual evidence or actual documented cases. I mean, I don't, I've never seen a, an award write-up where it talks about Soldier X uh, was awarded whatever medal because he was carrying an Argentinian rifle because of the full auto effect or, or whatever, something like that. Um, I, I've never, I've, I've simply never seen that. And it's difficult to it's difficult to um, uh, attribute that as as truth by just looking at uh, somebody's uh, second or third hand account from you know his father's friends at the pubs. Yeah, and, you know, we can, further to that, we can track um, uh, the historicity of this trope in so far as. I've always heard it. Uh, I've frequently heard it as they they take an Argentine FAL because they wanted to have select fire. Then I've also heard this one rumor that I've never been able to to prove one way or the other that the final assault on Stanley that begins June 11th through the 14th that um, that uh, in order to supply that final assault because so many other things had gone wrong during the British assault after the from the landings at, at San Carlos on May 21st all the way up through Goose Green, um, a number of things had gone badly wrong and that there were there was a shortage of small arms ammunition and as a as an adjunct to the old Argentine FAL trope, I've understood that there a large quantity of ammunition that was captured from the Argentine garrison at Goose Green was ammunition that was then used by um, uh, I can believe that entirely. I can too. I find that I am much more po. Uh, I'm I'm in a much more willing to agree position to that idea than I am to using the weapons. And uh, just to make one last point and beat the horse a little bit further, um, there's a lot of photographs of June 14th. There's a, some. There are a bunch of photographs taken once the ceasefire went into effect on June 14th, and then as troops move into Stanley itself um, <laughs> during the the discussions that start off as a um, uh, the, the discussions that will ultimately lead to the Argentine surrender. Um, and in all of the photographs of all of those troops who are under the ceasefire, but the surrender hasn't taken place yet, you don't see a single Argentine rifle. You see guys with with Sterlings and SLRs. And what, like there are, there's a series of these really amazing photographs of, um, of a large group of the Paris that assembled at the race course that's just out on the west side of town. And they're all sitting in the reviewing stand at the race course. And I just don't see any Argentine guns there. That, that's why I'm taking it, I'm taking it back to Pixar, it didn't happen. Now, in, in, on, on, on the, on, um, in addition to this though, I know, uh, there were comments that talked about uh, capturing ammunition off of 
uh, dead enemy troops. Ha now, I will put it this way. Of all, of all contacts, of all battles fought in the past, the Falklands was actually one of the more interesting ones that both sides used s pretty much the same rifles, the same pistols, uh, the same machine guns. I mean, the entire systems were very, very similar between the two. However, the magazine between the metric, the metric fouls, the Belgian-based fouls, and the SLR are not entirely interchangeable. The SLR can right. use the Argentinian magazines, but not the other way around. Um, so, of and all my experience of scenarios, so far with metric with metric mags in in an inch foul. I mean, it could be that that particular magazine, but they don't run as well. And people make the lugs right. to weld for people to weld on to convert metric to inch because yes. they run better, they're more stable. Yes. Yeah, so, so that that's a caveat to that is that um, can can it be done? Yes. Can it be done well? Uh, no. But my point to this is. People a lot of times talk about battlefield pickups, and I think that that's I think we've talked about this in the past that that's a very um, that's that's very driven by video games as yeah. of the past few decades. Yeah. The, the number of, of comments, pickups. the number of comments on the prep on the prep vid um, about oh yes, I take the SLR because then I could use battlefield pickup. It's you, you in in the scenario you're in no position pick up any ammunition because you're going the wrong way. If right. you get into a firefight, you're doing it to break contact and get back to a pickup point, whether it was helicopter or, or from the, uh, from the shoreline, you, you're not physically going to be in contact with someone with ammunition on them because wrong direction, basically. And yeah, as you say, it seems to, it seems to be a video game, trope where uh, you're always going forwards you're always overrunning positions and there's ammunition and you just have to press a button and it, you pick it up you don't have to rifle through pouches and uh covered in blood and what have you um but it's entirely not a not a concern in this scenario in the slightest well, my point is of all of the battles this is the closest that it comes to it being an actual viable ammunition resupply by via battlefield pickup. However, I still would not. Um, there's other concerns too. I mean, security concerns. You don't you, you don't want to be searching every dead body for uh, for stuff. And it's not just searching for ammunition. I mean, you don't know if it's a booby trapped body. You don't know if there's yeah. a sniper watching the body. I mean, there's a lot more uh, than just running to a body and grabbing ammunition. One thing though, again, you, when you're fighting a regular force, a lot of times, especially in the 80s, ammunition is generally carried in the same location, which makes searching for it much easier. But still, with the concern of traps and snipers and things of that nature, it's still not a good practice to capture enemy ammunition and directly pull it from bodies to use. Okay, we'll try to blaze through some of these and then get to the live session because I know people will want to make a, want to talk to uh, both of you gents. Ah, yes, this is this is something I personally should apologize for, and I know Mike is Mike knows what I'm talking about to begin with. In in the in the uh, scenario drop video, I accidentally clipped one portion where I was talking about the Royal Marines, and there was distinctly a red beret right there, and that is mm -hmm. my bad. Um, I know better. It was a lot of late night editing. I'm sorry. However, I did not know that it was the HMS uh, Hermes. Hermes? Herm Hermes. 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 <laughs> I'm still saying it. I, I lived in France, so and I worked. I worked with the um, the let's say high end retail. I, I worked with marketing for a high end retail when I lived in Paris. La Montre so, Hermes. <laughs> That's what I know. That's how I know to pronounce it. You're Ironically, I've done work for I them. Apologize. I, I apologize on um, calling a British war vessel by a French name. Um, how dare you? But it's a luxury I'm brand. Sure, you've, 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 you've made it more upmarket. You called it after a luxury a, brand. 
<laughs> it's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're on the HMS MS. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let's see if there's any that jump out. This is going with that, that one comment's going with yours. Um, and this we've already talked about that it was the actual, um, this is referencing the actual uh, uh, mission of Pebble Island. Um, but in fact, the actual mission, they had uh, M203s underslung on the assault force. Let's see. This is one thing that uh, I know Marty and I had talked about the, and, and it sort of goes a little bit towards the, um, uh, what we were talking about earlier as far as the, uh, uh, the automatic function. First of all, I, I, I don't think the paratrooper fell outside of, yes, it's nice that it folds very short, but when you shoot it, it's not very nice. And second of all, um, si Simon's talking about that it sounds, the SLR sounds similar to a foul. So if you have to shoot it, it sounds a lot more like the enemy's forces. I don't think this would be a, a specific, um, uh, a drawing point, a, a, a draw for me to choose the SLR because I don't necessarily think during a firefight in that environment, especially if you're facing a much larger force, you're wanting to blend in with them. I mean, that's that's... I think this is uh, a trope what are your from Heartbreak Ridge. This is a trope, trope from the film Heartbreak Ridge. That's a very specific source. Yes, um, it's. Uh, I think it's Clint Eastwood's character brasses up his trainees at close range with an AK-47 oh. or full auto and says, this is, uh, that is the sound of an AK-47. Uh, I'm not getting this quite right. The weapon of your enemy, learn it. It's... It's like, uh, yes, this... yes, because that's how all recon marines train, Mike. Didn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think that's where that one where that one comes from. Um, to be honest, when you're in the butts, a couple hundred yards off, um, and someone shooting two twenty three or three oh eight over your head. And it's going sort of 10 feet over your head. Yes, there is a bit of a difference, but certainly it's not a two way range. You're not scared. You're not cold. You're not tired. Um, are you going to be able to tell the difference between the crack thump of a 223 versus a, the crack thump of a 308? You're certainly not going to hear any action noise. Um, and even so, are you going to be able to act on it well i mean how would you how would you act on it i mean I, I i really think this is something that came from that vietnam film yeah i like where you're going with this because it makes me think of the old m1 myth about the ping of the clip the ping, and, uh, yes. and all that nonsense oh, it's almost because like someone what, did a video on that it's almost like someone did yeah imagine who well, on the range. Uh, but it it, it 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 reminds me of of experiences that I've had in the butts and, and doing a lot of shooting in my lifetime. And that is that um, without being under the duress of no sleep exposed to the bitter cold of the South Atlantic and under the duress of um, being in combat with an enemy force, without any of that, I find that I can generally tell the difference between a rifle shot and a pistol shot. And that's about it. I mean, sort of at, say 100, 200, 300 yards, you can normally tell the difference if you've got like a 308 on the target next to you and a 223 on your target, you can kind of hear the difference. Uh, if someone fired around at you and said, over, and said, what was that? You'd be like a rifle. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's loud. The, the, the supersonic crack is loud. And then you hear a boof. Um, and that's it. And, and, this isn't close quarter combat what we're talking here that basically our team if having to exfiltrate under fire would be firing at the range at which the enemy are just about capable of delivering effective fire to give them the big f off as i phrased it mm -hmm. previously which is still going to be of the order of of a few hundred yards 
So this right. whole the clash clack thing is a is a close range thing. You can yes, a, cl a close range. If you're standing next to a Kalashnikov on the range, it sounds different to an AR-15. But you're like on the range right next to it. You're, you're also not fighting. You're also fighting. Um, I know Marty. Marty talks about some of the more crack troops that the Argentinians had, but there were a lot of them who were conscripts. Uh, right. Yeah. And also what we're talking about, too, is an airfield mission. So there's going to be Argentine Air Force personnel there. Not that I'm taking anything away from them, but I believe that they wouldn't really compare in terms of fighting skill against like 5th uh, Mechanized Infantry Battalion or 7th Mechanized Infantry Regiment um, or the Butso Tactico or the, you know, the Naval Infantry units. They wouldn't be really be something to compare to those units. They would be trained and they would be uh, presumably confident uh, competent, but I don't know that we could count on them to be the best and brightest that the Argentines had to offer. In so, any, in any, in any, in any case, the, uh, the, 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 the similar sound or different sound thing is a, is a very close up thing. Yeah. In any case. Um, um, they all hit all rounds. All rounds passing close by hit the brown note. <laughs> so, gents, we are running. We are running short on time. I do want to give the viewers a point, uh, a an opportunity of um, uh, asking us questions on the live stream. I wanted to open the floor up to them, but before that, I wanted to ask you if there are any further comments that you had. Anything that stood out to you on the uh, viewer comments? Oh, one thing, because I've, I'm having system issues today, I didn't pull it up right away. Um, the SLR won at 57% of the votes versus the M16's 43%. Which is interesting given that the actual guys that had to do it for real, all of them took M16s. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's, the, it's the, uh, that classic draw of the beautiful silhouette of the SLR, my friend. I mean, maybe they just didn't take Aliness into account. Uh, <laughs> Did you talk about Aliness earlier? We didn't. We didn't get a chance to talk about Aliness. So, one of your points was the Aliness of an M16. What is an Ali? What is Aliness? Okay. Aliness is um, basically anything that's seen as cool because it's different, because it's special, because it's associated with special forces guys. Anything that sets people apart, and it can be anything from clothing, equipment, or weapons. So, if you were in the Royal Marines and had access, could get you grubby mitts on an M16 variant, it would be an alley thing to have. Um, I mean, basically, it's, it's basically it's fashion. And you said that in your time in the army, you had you have very much the same phenomenon. Oh, yeah. You didn't call it alley. And yeah, as no, no, it's, it, we didn't Neil a, says, alleyness saves lives. <laughs> well, okay, so we didn't have a term for it. But so I, you know, as one of the officers who was in my unit for a longer amount of time before I had left Germany. Um, I was still issued some of the older, early GWAT era equipment, the I IBA to be specific. So I was, at, at by the time I left, I was this captain running around with an IBA, which screams, you know, mid early time Iraq, you know, going in. But I, I, I loved wearing that thing in garrison. And so did some of the older NCOs. I enjoyed it because it was um, more comfortable than the IOTV. Because the IOTV, you had to go, you have to lope it over your head, you have to zip everything, and then it was just, it was really bulky. And I love my my IBA because I just wore it like a Vietnam flak jacket and just zipped everything and let's go. Um, but the other part of it, I found out some of the NCOs liked it because. Um, and I, this isn't the only reason, but some of the younger soldiers would recognize that the more the 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 saltier NCOs had IBAs and and some of the older equipment that was better. We still had a small amount of woodland, woodland yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, woodland stuff. I I my I still have I still have my uh, my my uh, my field uh, chair that's in uh, woodland camouflage. And we still like some of the earlier issued stuff just because you couldn't get it anymore in the supply system. And we still had it on hand because until you turn it in to CIF, um, unless you were clearing the base, 
you could still hold on to it. And and some items, if you were going from base to a different PCS, you would still hold on to it. So if you'd been in for a while, you could potentially still hold on to some items that had been really early issue. And that was a cool thing for some younger soldiers to see. Same with the very new stuff. So I was one of the, I was one of the, um, when I was the generation that first used multicam in Afghanistan. So that was also, um, I suppose, in Mike's terms, alliness. As we went into yeah. Afghanistan, and there were still people in the stupid ACU strolling around in that gray uniform. We were in this cool multicam that previous to us were just special operations using. Yeah. Yeah, in, in modern British parlance, yeah, that would have been Ali if you you were an early uh, early adopter of that. And someone's mentioned there some of the officers had had barber jackets. Definitely mm. Ali. Oh, the um, there's that photograph of the Argentinian special op, special forces commando who has the uh, L34, the suppressed yeah. sterling, mm -hmm. and he has the uh, almost like a fleece. I don't know what it is. It's like a fleece. Oh, the parkers, the, the padded yeah. parkers they had. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you see? Now, now that's a bit of captured equipment you see used. Mm. There's photos. There's, there's, there's a good number of photos of British soldiers wearing captured Argentine parkers. All right. So before, as, as, we, as we tie this up, we've got, we've got, let's see, I'm just going to jump into the last segment to capture any type of, uh, any live questions uh, that we have on hand. And we'll do um, the outro uh, for you guys to engage the audience as, as we want. So, look at the comments section. See there what there was something uh, I just want to I just want to pick up there. There's someone making a claim that um, in the in the Middle East people wouldn't respond to five five six suppression like seven point six two suppression because the crack wasn't as loud. Um, having been in the butts with both going over my head, they're both loud. Because it's a supersonic, it's a supersonic shockwave. Um, mm -hmm. You don't. I mean, if you couldn't, you shoot a round of one or the other over over my head. I could not tell you the difference. Uh, I would say in the Middle East, and and it's, there's different parts of the Middle East that you would be shooting five five six versus seven six two. Um, seven six two really commanded more respect when you're shooting into mud huts. Yeah. If it's making so, holes in stuff, it will certainly. I mean, okay, I can't speak. I've not been on a two-way range. I can't speak for this, but I've seen it hit stuff. And yes, yeah, seven six two makes bigger holes in stuff. So I can okay. see that. But it's but the supersonic crack is not. I mean, you'd need measurement equipment to be able to. Yeah. Tell which see. is which. Apriori. Do you see any comments that you would like me to bring up on screen? Um, there's 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 a lot of people asking about um, wind because we haven't talked about wind yet. Um, yeah. Okay. So so let's talk about as wind far as wind, I think part of it, you know, um, uh, our practical accuracy series, we 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 deal with wind a lot. Um, one of my reasons I, I put my pick as the L1A1 was specifically because of wind. With five five six, within three hundred meters yeah it's no problem 400 meters typically with a 20 inch barrel still not bad um but past that you really have serious issues with wind especially if you're running um m193s um so what's your thought on wind mine is know your hold offs that it's a training issue um yes yes a lower wind drift like a flatter trajectory means you can suck more. But fundamentally, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, if you know your hold offs, it, it shouldn't be an issue. And it, with respect to the specific scenario, it's suppressive fire. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly hitting. It just has to be passing close enough to cause to, to, to give off the brown note to to um, s slow the other guys down while you break while you break contact because fundamentally aiming at a man-sized target at 300 or 400 is over irons or even with a four-power scope is hard um, and the amount of missing that goes on is a lot in any case um, 
so yeah, I think it's um, I think it's I think it's overblown that the slight advantage in not having to be quite so good at wind calling and not have to hold off quite so much for wind is a small consideration compared to the so, fact that the M16 is a much better rifle for this. So I think I think um, my thoughts on this. I think wind hold offs. Of course, the M16 you require more. Uh, bottom line is, if you're looking at the M16, you're looking at a 400 meter or less engagement. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, well, wind is I mean, still manageable up to 400 meters, in my opinion. But if funda- you're talking funda- about, go. sorry, fundamentally, if you set if you set the sights on a pre A2, um, doctrinally, the long range aperture is at 375 meters anyway, so it's only really good to 400. And right, it's M193. It's 55 grain. So I think you more can't. so, more so, drawing to the conclusion is: Are you looking at a 400 meter plus engagement? And at that point, wind is a part of the concern because sub 400 meters, wind doesn't doesn't necessarily translate to either. Yes, you can do hold off, no problem. Sub 400 meters for either one of them. Um, so at the end of the day, like Marty was talking about, is this a? Are we talking about a? Um, an engagement at night, if that's the case, then you absolutely are talking about sub 400 meter engagement. Very much. Well, sub. E- well even, sub. With, even with a suit, you are not shooting at 400 meters at night. No, nobody's shooting at 400 meters at night. No. So, no. so Other when, with when, machine gun with a, with a night sight on it. Um, right. I mean, this is, this is really only a concern if you're doing a daytime um, exfil under fire, but you've, you're being chased by conscripts so you only have to outshoot them Mm -hmm. and scare them and keep them delayed and down um i mean how close are they going to have to get to you when they're plodding through the bog right to actually put effective fire on you because that's your distance of the that you're going to worry about and and realistically um because i'm i'm sure i think Marty mentioned it, that it's not the elite troops that are going to be garrisoning this airfield. Right. How close are they going to have to get having plodded through the bog to actually bring dangerous effective fire onto you? And can you nail them at that distance if you need to? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think a lot of times the, the wind, yes, it's a consideration, but a lot of times you've really got to reconsider the entire mission set and the METC um, analyses before you even look at the wind as the sole consideration to it. It's just my thought. Mm. Yeah, you know this is fascinating because I'm I'm enjoying listening to this conversation um, that we have more recently had about Afghanistan, for example, where we where we continue to ask these these platforms to do it all, and we we want small caliber, high velocity. Uh, for volume of fire and for close end fire, but we want um, uh, we want a battle rifle cartridge for longer engagement ranges, and um, we really haven't reconciled these two ideas, have we? Uh, the ideas that, like during World War II, with the introduction of like the Sturm Gewehr, everybody thought, oh, finally one gun that can do it all. And if there's anything that's been proven in the last 80 years of the development of small arms, is that you're not going to find one platform that can do it all. And they were dealing with it almost 40 years ago in the Falklands. We've more recently dealt with it in Afghanistan. I imagine that it's something that's not really going to go away. Mm. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a lot to be said for the DMR concept of having <laughs> one guy in an infantry section with a scoped, reasonably accurate rifle that can do that and give everyone else 556. Five, and you've got a you got a good mix, a good uh, good balance in there. Yeah. Okay, so so um, Carl over at InRange actually commented, and he made a good point um, on wind. But before we get to his comment, Mr. Spetsnaz here was talking about was a consideration of holding the airfield ever um, uh, after taking holding the airfield after taking ever brought up. No, it, it actually on the on the actual mission set it was not brought up to no. to hold the airfield. It, there's an aircraft carrier that. Hermes, <laughs> there it is. He's um, got it. <laughs> was um, was was there for for British aircraft use, and and they didn't really look at the airfield as a um, 
as a a, a location to hold. Yeah. Um, on top of that, I mean, they were sabotaged. They were blowing up the the, the airframes um, on ground. Um, yeah. So there would have been wreckage to clear. And then they were also flying Harriers, which were um, VTOLs. Yeah, and, and importantly further to that point is that the date of this mission is May 15th. The opposed amphibious landings at San Carlos have not happened yet. They won't happen until May 21st. So there is no physical presence on the ground in the, in the Falklands archipelago uh, by British forces yet. And right. so with that being the case, you're definitely not going to have a small SAS insertion team hold an airfield because the enemy could overwhelm you so easily. They could have mm -hmm. flown in. They could have flown in a reinforcing element the next day. So if there had been an if there had been an attempt to hold the airfield, they would have just been swept aside the following day anyway because the British don't hold any real estate in the archipelago yet. Right. So, yeah. um, Mike, you were saying. No, I was, I was, uh, I was going to say this comes back to Henry's point about this being a, a classic uh, boys' own World War Two SAS mm -hmm. thing of uh, roll in there, rough it up a bit, sod off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In and out, and when you can, when you consider it, when you imagine the Pebble Island raid within the context of what will ultimately happen beginning on the twenty first, which is the landings at San Carlos where the task force largely surprises the Argentines by landing on the west side of East Falkland rather than in an area more immediately close to Stanley itself. Uh, when you consider that uh, that was a preliminary to moving into the waterway that divides West Falkland and East Falkland, they couldn't have, they couldn't allow uh, an Argentine aerodrome to exist, even though those aircraft weren't necessarily particularly threatening, at least not to the warships, Pucaros and T-34s aren't going to sink a ship. But nevertheless, they would be able to, um, they would be able to in interfere with the amphibious landing. And that's why this had to be done as a preemptive, uh, a preemptive attack uh, against this, this, small airfield to prevent them from interfering with the landings that will subsequently take place on May 21st. Right. It's, it's, um, it's a huge threat to the infantry. Uh, that's all that's basically operating. I mean, having one of the, one of the major advantages of us troops is having that type of air superiority. I mean, can you imagine if, F if the Taliban had <laughs> air superiority, <laughs> we would not be operating the same way. Yeah. Let's say um, I did bring up Carl's point. Full value wind drift on yeah. M80 ball and yes, M193 isn't all that. It's, it, it's all not different. anywhere near as much. The difference, there is a difference. It's not as much as people imagine. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it wouldn't be the first time I agree with Carl. It, it, it would be honestly the the difference. The difference is terminal terminal velocity, and you know the XM193's wounding capabilities really reliant on velocity, and that velocity massively dropping at the for 500 meter mark. Yeah, but you're um, not going to be shooting is, 500 meters because right, the sights right. don't go anywhere near it. So, <laughs> so that that is that is the downside to the the M16 is the M1. But you're not going to be engaging. You're not going to be engaging at that. Uh, all right, is this a good point? M62 anyway, uh, Mike, is this a good point for me to actually reveal my actual pick? Maybe. Uh, to, to disappoint the SLR, the, the majority of people who voted for the SLR, my actual pick is the M16. And that's, that's not through any allegiance to, um, to you know, the US, but more so it makes sense as a recon force. Um, one thing that actually uh, one, of my, one of my Marine friends brought up when he watched this video was the insertion technique. Now, I've, I've, been, I've been majority, a very ground-based I've been a very, you know, in a very ground-based units uh, my entire time in. So, you know, aerial insertions and 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 ground insertions. That's that's what I'm used to. So I didn't even have a consideration on pushing in by kayak. But um, early on during officer training, uh, one of the things was that the water survival training. I mean, they would. Um, this is more prevalent in the Pacific than it is to to us in in Europe. Um, but um, I remember they, they they would they would shove you into a four meter deep pool with kit and you had to pull the kit off. You had a rifle, you had an M16, it's a rubber duck, it's not a real rifle, but it simulates a real rifle. And you had to swim across 25 or 50 meters 
holding the rifle on top of your head in full fatigues with uh, with boots on. So it's not you're not with you know you're not in in swim gear. And people underestimate the difficulty of doing that with even just fatigues and boots and a rifle, much less if you were rolling with an SLR with 762 ammunition and a scope attached to it, that would be very difficult to do a kayak insertion and actually survive any overturned kayaks. Because remember the, the environment, the, the ocean, the sea was, was not very forgiving over, over there in the north side of the island. Um, but it's not just because of that. That's one aspect that I didn't think about was the insertion technique. Um, the other thing that um, really stood out to me is practically that. The mission set dictates for zero shots fired. That's, that's the goal of it. And if Absolutely. there are shots fired... I would like to have the massive maximum amount of firepower to escape evade and get picked up by my extraction team or extract myself via kayak. So that's really, I mean, the SLR I think would be a good choice if you were a, um, a foot soldier, if you were a Royal Marine, if you were a, a para who was on foot for months upon end and pushing the varied terrain and, and long distances that were present on the um, on the main side of the uh, Falklands that Marty showed with the uh, with the mined fields, uh, but for this specific mission set, the M sixteen is a no brainer. I had to choose the SLR though because there has to be a devil's advocate towards uh, <laughs> the argument. Um, can I just pick up on quickly on on something that came past? There's someone saying, well, seven point six two stays supersonic out to eight hundred and fifty meters." Well, you're not okay. shooting at Okay, it's sighted. The SLR is sighted, irrespective of whether it's irons or the suit sight, is sighted to six hundred yards or meters, close enough for government work. And the M16 <laughs> is sighted to three hundred and seventy-five, which gives you, with the trajectory, you can still aim more or less center of mass at 400 meters. So uh, anything beyond the the effective range is infinity. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. And Sorry. I just want, I want to throw one thing in here because I think some of these um, considerations are a bit on the academic side. I would just point oh, yeah. out that like the spot where the Ian Mackay Victoria Cross action takes place on the night of June 12th on Mount Longdon, the point where Mackay and his men got pinned down, they had they were attempting to flank around um, the positions on the northward facing. Now that would be the westward fa facing slope of Mount Longdon, and they rolled around to the northward facing slope to try to outflank the position and walked up on an Argentine Mag 58 that opened fire from a range of 20 meters, and so. Oh. It, his, and they were behind rock, so they were fine, but they couldn't they couldn't pull back away from the engagement. And Mackay charged the position and killed the gunners in the position. And so I, I mention it just because that action, I, to me, functions as such a powerful metaphor for the way that things finally went down in the hills around Stanley. And that is so much of that fighting was at night and at ranges that were so close that academic thoughts about whether or not the 7.62 by 51 oh, yeah. millimeter cartridge remains supersonic at 850 meters um, oh, feels a bit like of a diversion. Oh, completely. And uh, John Stacy says, Mike, you're not going to engage targets that far away. Exactly. That's my point. You're not going to engage targets anywhere near that far away. I mean, in this scenario, and the point I was making about the uh, effective range of conscripts giving chase, you're probably, worst case scenario, not going to be firing much over 200 or so. Yeah. Simply because, simply because, if they're just putting fire vaguely in your direction, obviously there's a chance of being hit by something by chance. Um, but you're not going to waste time stopping to return fire. You're just going to keep going. You're only going to turn around and try and give them the f off when when they're actually a problem to you which is unlikely to be much over 200 meters, realistically. Yeah. All right. So um, let's see. I think right now we are at the oh, – for goodness sake, this is the longest live stream we've done. We're at the, <laughs> yeah, someone's saying SLR effective range was tall to 600 meters in group fire. 
in section five. Yeah. 300, 300 in individual fire. I mean, I, I've, got a paper, I've got the paper manual I could check, but it'll take me too long. Um, there we are. So, What about vehicles and penetration of light cover? You're not getting vehicles across that terrain. I mean, the only vehicles you were looking at there were, I mean, there were light vehicles that the Argentinians used and, of course, the aircraft that you were shooting at. But it's, that's not your mission. You're, you're a recon element. Yep. I mean, yep. you're not trying to plug uh, holes in things. Exactly. I mean, this is all uh, shit hits the fan stuff. Do we, if we have to do a hot exfiltration, what do we have to deal with? And I don't think vehicles come come into that in that scenario. I mean, yeah. you you've seen the Grand Marty. Are you going to drive a Land Rover over much of that? Well, you're not going to be able to. Even if you could, um, you're not going to be able to drive up to where the Overwatch team was. Mm. Yeah, they, they had some elevation. They were up in the rocks. They they were above the airfield. Yeah, and then someone's pointed out a British vehicle, <laughs> CVRT Scorpion. Um, there were some there, yeah. yeah. But again, this is before May 21st. So, um, the task force hasn't begun landing yet. So uh, at this at this moment, gents, uh, unfortunately, I've got to start uh, winding our podcast down. Um, oh, that... I did not mean to show that. That is the next, the next yeah. item. Noticed, Oof, that's out of the And right Carl's now. just posted something else I agreed with, so uh, we can. That's, that's a good. It's a good point that's, to segue. That's into, out of the uh, bag for the next one. But before we get in, into the uh, the next uh, pick, one gents, uh, wanted to ask both of you: Do you have anything else that you wanted to contribute towards? Uh, you know any final points that you wanted to talk about? I know Marty just talked about the, the, um, the night fighting characteristics of, of the actual skirmishes. Um, was there anything that we did not cover? Yeah, well, I, I was just looking at one question that I thought I'd throw at you real quick. And the question that came from a listener that says, would you pick a submachine gun instead of the M16 for maximum mobility and lower report? I think there's something to be said for considering that as a possibility. It, not for the, the mission that we've been talking about so much, but when you consider those battles in the hills around Stanley, eventually devolved mm -hmm. into infantry action at extreme close range at night, I think there's something to be said for the sub guns. I think Marty actually showed me an image of a soldier, uh, a, an assistant machine gunner who had a Sterling and an M79 grenade launcher. Right, it's this Imagine really thing around with that combination. Yeah, the cool. If you find the photo, it's the it's from Goose Green. It's from the Goose Green battle on May 29th, and it's he's a two para guy. This is up after the Argentines have surrendered and they're moving in to take prisoners, and they've got a bunch of Argentine wounded, and it's a GPMG section. And so his his gunner is right next to him, and the, the he's got the butt of the GPMG sitting on the ground, and he's got his Sterling just slung around his neck, right around his his sternum. He's got a belt for the GM, GPMG around his neck, and he's carrying the M79 grenade launcher in his right hand. And I'm like, you were the biggest badass on East Falkland <laughs> that day, my friend. That's a pretty tough little team right there. Mag 58 with an A gunner with an M79. Yeah, and it, it, it flows back into the, the idea that, that uh, by this stage, the uh, the Sterling was basically a PDW yeah. for people PDW. who buggered with other things. In this case, the M79. And right. he's also included, ended up as the uh, the number two on the gun to carry ammo as well. Yeah. Right. So, uh, gents, anything else on top of that? The SMG is a, is a good point. In, in fact, I think we're going to work with both of you on, you know, if we ever get nine millimeter back in inventory on mm -hmm. um, the Sterling video. Um, but alas, Jim, like, is I there anything else? By saying I've got 5,000 rounds there and I've got 5,000 coming in the post next week. <laughs> Sorry. Useless Sometimes we have to brag. In. So cruel. So cruel, Mike. Well, I mean, your ammo, your ammo issues are going to impact us because apparently um, you lot over there have been buying European factories production forward for quite a long time. I'm not going to say sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Well, I'm, I'm likewise, sorry, not sorry. Mm -hmm. For once, we have the advantage. 
So, uh, Sorry, gents, at this, at this point, no. Um, is there anything else that uh, either one of you would like to bring up on the topic itself? Um, I think there's just one more little comment that went past there, it's, um, um, which is if 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 the if the opposition have got rifles capable of 600 meters, uh, you're out range with the M16. Um, this is it's not a game of top trumps, you know, the card game where you where you'd have like race cars or dinosaurs or or whatever, where it's a, just a game of pure statistics, because no, like like using an iron sighted 762 rifle at 600 meters is non trivial and is not going to happen effectively from conscripts. Full stop. Amen. So, so then the rifle might be capable of 600, but the entire system of the person with the rifle isn't anywhere near. That's a really good point. So, so it's not just a game of what is the theoretical effective range of this. It's what's the it's training. It's 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 training. It's not gear, and it's something that I go on about on my channel. Carl does on in range as well. Henry, you I think you do as well. Um, the the weak link in the chain is the person. It's the yeah. human, and all the, 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 I've seen things going past with it's a two minute two minute of angle rifle. It's a four minute of angle rifle. The vast majority of soldiers are worse shooters than the rifles. Yeah. Yeah, the, I, I'm used to making this point about the American Civil War, particularly about like the 1853 Enfield rifle. And the point that I always make is just because the, the platform's capable of doing a great deal doesn't mean that it's going to have a user that's capable of getting the most out of it. It's like my mother has one of these, but she doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> it's just because somebody has um, an SLR doesn't mean that they're gonna be putting down accurate and reliable fire against point targets at 300 meters. Exactly. Exactly. The, the, okay. the, the human is the weak link in the chain, always, yeah. in these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, anything else? I think that's it. It's, it is almost 10 past <laughs> 1 in the morning. This, this is way, <laughs> it's like four hours past my normal bedtime. Oh, yeah. That's how so, crap I am. As, as we end this, I do want to thank uh, Mike from Bloke on the Range. If you haven't heard of Mike's channel, uh, please do give them a visit. Uh, Mike and uh, Mike and I, with Josh, we actually do a fair amount of collaborations. I think we've done more with you than anybody else, just sprinkled all yeah, over exactly. the place. Um, Mike, is there anything you would like to tell us about your channel? Anything upcoming? Um, it's a mixture of gun nerdery, military <laughs> history, um, just basically stuff I think is cool, generally. Mm -hmm. I work with uh, Fabian, who is uh, known as the chap when we were being pseud pseudon pseudonym. Anyway, sorry, it's, it's <laughs> 1 a.m. Well, when we were using pseudonyms, um, that didn't last long. Um, but uh, yeah, if you enjoy that kind of thing, um, please come and give us a visit. Upcoming stuff. Uh, I do a lot of Enfield nerdery and Swiss rifle nerdery, and uh, a mixture of yeah, sports shooting, historic guns, military history, that sort of thing. And uh, if you like that kind of thing, please uh, hit us up. And I will drop a link in the description at the end of this. And Marty uh, actually runs a channel as well. Uh, Midway 512? That's Yeah, that's my, my channel. All it is is a bunch of videos of me shooting my guns. No big deal. <laughs> uh, it's he doesn't say anything in many of his videos, but he right. does have some very interesting rifles and machine guns to show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so many other great content creators out there that have a lot better things to say about the firearms than I do. Uh, it's like, Mike, I'm, I'm pleased to finally meet you because I've known and admired your work for a long time now. Oh, thank you. And, you know, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. My ple pleasure is all mine. And I, I just kind of decided I would do nothing but videos of the guns because there are other content creators out there that are saying things better than I think I ever could. Um, so it's just lots of videos of me blazing away with sub guns and Sturm Gewehrs and things like that. Oh, just cool stuff, basically. Things like that. <laughs> Less nerd, more cool. However, right, right. remember, remember, Marty, it does work on uh, cable TV. So um, if you are, my wife and I, like, we like to watch a lot of documentaries. So whenever we see Marty, we're like, ah, we know this celebrity on TV. So if you do see Marty on TV, just know that you've seen him uh, on our channel. And I'd love to have you back, Marty, on a dedicated pick one and perhaps 
at that point, Mike will give a, a, a secondary uh, consideration on uh, uh, whatever scenario we pick, if you would come back. I would love to. I, I enjoy the channel, and I enjoy being a part of it, and I appreciate the invitation to be a part of this discussion. No offense to Josh, but I enjoyed filming in for him. Well, we, it was great having you, and thank you for the first-hand information on the Falkland Islands and the yeah, that was fantastic. Um, the Argentinian forces. Now, before we go, I'd like to tease the next scenario, which I unfortunately have accidentally already teased the next scenario. I think we still have in range in the comments section, I hope. Do we? Regardless, the next scenario is a very is a very fictional scenario and anyone who is familiar with the Fallout franchise of video games will know uh, the uh, Fallout boy and um, anyone who knows our type of content will know that we've actually worked with Carl in the past as well. So the next live discussion is going to be a post-apocalyptic world. And your choices are going to be between a surplus bolt action rifle with a three and a half by scope or a four by scope and a 22 suppressed pistol or a Kalashnikov type rifle with iron sights. Now, <laughs> part of this, and we'll publish a challenge in the mid-month time frame will be tied to InRange's uh, two-gun action challenge match. There will be a stage that is uh, this pick one scenario. And there will be a challenge for everyone at home to take, uh, to take it to your range and film and, and tag your own video to it. However, we will drop this scenario a little bit later in the month of April. So uh, look. Look ahead to that and uh, look out for that scenario drop. So anyways, gents, we are at the end of our live session broadcast. Um, I'll ask you, is, is there anything else that you have that you would like to talk to the audience about or tell the audience? Subscribe to his Patreon, <laughs> Patreon if you haven't already done so. Yeah. Thank you. I was the first. So I'm leading by, <laughs> by example. Well, gents, again, thank you for uh, taking your time, uh, Mike. Bonsoir. Thank you for having me. Everybody out there, take care. Have a good weekend. Have a good evening. And we will see you on the range. 916, this is 716, Roger, over. 716, Bill 91, one pack, green, green, over. 716, Roger, over. I think Bill 92, one big door, two packs, Raycon, one, over. I'm so knackered. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. It's super late for you. Are we still live? <laughs> are we? It says this we are still. Hi, hey, everybody. Is there anything else we should talk about? <laughs> Sleepers of the week. We are still live, aren't we?